Hello, and welcome to the Collective Church Podcast. These messages are from our Sunday services at the Collective Church in Boise, Idaho. If you are new with us or just checking us out, please visit our website at collectivechurch.org. We would love to hear from you and connect with you. We pray that this message is both uplifting and encouraging. All right, well... Thank you for that. Yes, historicity is a real word. Uh, I love history. I love the study of history, biblical history uh, in particular. And, uh, and so uh, I like to nerd out. Uh, this morning we might nerd out together a little bit because uh, it's fun. And uh, I like to learn and I like to study. And so we're going to do a little bit of that this morning. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, again, my name is Joe Oliver, uh, not to be confused. And um, uh, my lovely wife and my daughter uh, are back there, uh, and we're so glad to have them. And uh, Isaac, Lydia's boyfriend, I will mention him, Isaac. Um, the boyfriend's in the house, too. Um, <laughs> I've been pastoring here in the Valley for uh, uh, roughly 20, uh, 22 years uh, here, and uh, and uh, done different things. I moved here in June of 2000. I was a youth pastor here in the Valley uh, for seven years, uh, which is a long time to be a youth pastor. Youth pastors don't usually last that long, but uh, I made it, stuck around, and then in 2007, uh, God put on my heart to start a church, uh, which my wife and I uh, stepped out in faith and uh, led a church for 10 years, and you're going to hear a little bit of that story this morning. Uh, I currently serve as an associate pastor at Real Life Ministries, and, uh, um, and I'm, I'm just glad to be here this morning with you and to share with you. Um, we're going to go on a little bit of a journey. Uh, we're going to look at a, a, a piece of text uh, in Scripture that um, uh, Paul talked about, and it's a pretty familiar text, and we're going to look at that in a second. But as I was thinking over what I wanted to share with you, this is what came to mind. What we do when we don't know what to do. What we do when we don't know what to do. And as I was praying over coming and sharing, this is what the statement that God put on my heart. And then it began to build out from there where we're going to go today. But we're going to unpack um, uh, an area of Scripture. And um, so to help you understand a little bit what we're doing, um, there is this term in the culinary arts. My wife and I love watching cooking shows. Uh, any Top Chef fans out there? Top Chef fans. Love Top Chef. We love the cooking shows. Um, and uh, we watch, watch them regularly. And one year on Top Chef, uh, the chefs were doing this thing with the food. And um, it was a style of cooking that I'd never heard of before. And it was called deconstruction is this style of cooking, which ultimately what you do is you have this meal that you, you uh, are going to eat, and you're familiar with the taste and the flavors and all that go into it, but what you do is you separate the components of that meal into their individual components, um, and then uh, when, you, when they're individual, when you yeah, put it all together and take one bite, it becomes the meal that you're used to, to eating. It's really interesting and, and complicated, but this is what we're going to do this morning. We're going to take an area of the text, and we're going to actually expose it. We're going to break it out into different parts, and we're going to look at those parts individually, hopefully with, with uh, um, when we get done with this, that we can bring it all together and see it for what it is as a whole. But first, we've got to break it apart to understand it, and then we're going to pull it all back together at the end. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to do a little uh, deconstruction here of the text. And the text in mind that we're going to be looking at is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, um, for those of you that have been to church any number of years of your life or have been to a wedding at some point in your life, 1 Corinthians 13 is probably the verse that you heard. You're familiar with this. the famous love chapter that Paul talks about here. So Paul, um, a guy that would go around and start uh, churches, if you're not familiar with, with the Bible, um, he would go around from place to place, uh, different cities in, in the ancient world, and, uh, and start churches, little church communities, house churches. A lot of times he would work in a place place for a number of years, um, uh, and uh, he, was, he was a bivocational, so he worked full-time, and then he would help start these churches, and once they got up and launched, he would move on, and then he would write back to the churches to, to help them out with struggles that they were having. It's, what's interesting to think is that our New Testament, what Paul writes, most of all of what Paul writes, he's dealing with church mess. 
Like we have most of our New Testament because Paul had to help people through church mess. There were issues going on. He would leave and then he would hear, get reports back and he would uh, uh, hear what was going on. He'd be like, man, I got to write these guys. And he would just start writing letters. I'm like, no, don't do that. You know, do this. Don't, what, why are you guys fighting about this? Focus on this. And this is what he's doing. And, and Corinthians is one of those famous letters. Um, Corinthians, uh, we have two of the three letters that we know that Paul wrote uh, in Corinthians. So two Corinthians is actually three Corinthians if we had uh, the second letter. And we know of this letter because he talks about it in 1 Corinthians. That's all nerd stuff, not a big deal, but he's writing to a church that's struggling. They have a lot of issues um, that he's trying to help them out with. And he moves through this letter, helping them. He's fixing things. He's correcting things. And then he begins to help them understand how to act as a church. What is the way that you should act? How should you treat each other? And so in chapter 12, you have this uh, teaching uh, about the body, and he says it's one body, many parts. He talks about how there's all the different parts that, that a body. There's one head that is Jesus, and then there's lots of different parts that, that, that play in this, this community. Because the early first century church was the most like diverse community out there. You had slaves. You had free people. Uh, you had all different nationalities, a melting pot of cultures coming around. You had men. You had women. Um, you had all these different types. You had the rich. You had the poor. All coming together in one house trying to figure out how to be faithful to this guy named Jesus. And so it was, it was just crazy, lots of things going on. So Paul's like, look, we are all one body. There are many parts. You all play a part. And so he's helping them understand that you gotta, you got to play that part well. And to play that part well, he goes into chapter 13. you got to understand how to love people well. Because when you're in a group of, of people that are diverse, sometimes you don't always get along. Sometimes you don't see eye to eye. And you know what? That's actually healthy. We need different perspectives. We need people to see the world differently from us to help us see the world in new and beautiful ways. So that's the beauty of the church is all the diversity that comes in it. But it has to be rooted. If you're going to function, if you're going to get through it, you got to have love. So it might be surprising for some of you to know that chapter 13 was not written so that pastors one day can use it in their sermons uh, in marriages. Chapter 13 was written to a community like this. The, love, the famous love chapter is trying to tell people how to interact with each other in environments just like this. And then at the end of chapter 13, he wraps it up with this statement. This is what we're going to work on uh, this morning. Uh, he wraps it up with this statement. Now, um, this is uh, verse 12 and verse 13, uh, if you're following along in your Bibles. If not, I'm going to put it up on the screen. And uh, I'm going to share this kind of broken down into three different stages. Chapter 12 broken down into two parts, and then chapter 13 all together. And we're going to look at this. So Paul starts out, he just gets done giving the most beautiful, like, on, on par with, like, Shakespeare, man. And he writes this beautiful thing, you know, love is patient, love is kind. And, and he goes on. It's just the most, you know, that's why it's being read at marriages. Um, um, but then he wraps it up with these thoughts. He says this. He says, for now I see through an angled mirror. Now, what does he mean there? Okay, so if, if you've ever, like, uh, you have a mirror and, you, and you're looking at the mirror, but you can see the thing that's around the corner by looking at the mirror, that's what he's talking about. He says, right, right now, the way that we see the world is through an angled mirror. And he says, but there will be a day where we will see face to face. We won't have to look at the angled mirror. What he's talking about is this idea that, that a guy named N.T. Wright, one of our like, m most brilliant minds, like a modern-day C.S. Lewis, um, uh, N.T. Wright, he says this. He, he talks about this as the already, not yet. He says, we live in the already, not yet. We live in the reality of resurrection has come because we have died to our sins and come alive in Christ, but not yet. In that, we are still awaiting the hope of the future reality that, that is promised to followers of Jesus of a final resurrection, which Paul actually talks about in chapter 15 of the same letter. 
the already not yet, the angled mirror. For now, I see through an angled mirror. It's like I see the reflection, but I'm not seeing the reality of it in its fullness. But one day we'll see face to face. He says, for now I know in part, in part, for now I know some of it. I, I, I have an idea of how it works, right? And I think I got this up on the screen. He says, but then I will know fully. One day I'll know fully just as I am fully known. So he's talking about this tension that we all are in. The, the, what we do when we don't know what to do moments of our life. There's a tension of like we, we, we see a glimpse of a reality, but we can't yet grasp it. And then he wraps it up, and most of your translations are going to read it like this. Um, then these three remain, and then you have the faith, hope, and love. These three remain. A better way to understand what Paul's actually wrestling with here is he says, he says, so this is what we keep doing. When we're living in the already, not yet, the in-between, for now I know in part, I'm waiting for the day I know fully. I'm looking at the angled mirror, and I'm waiting for the day where I see face to face. He says, this is what you keep doing. For these three remain. This is what you do. When you are in a place where you don't know what to do, Paul's saying this is what you do. Faith, hope, love. And you might be thinking, well, that, do, that doesn't feel very clear to me. Like, okay, what do you mean? What do you mean, Paul? And this is what we're going to de deconstruct. He says, faith, hope, and love. Let love rule, right? These three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Let love rule, okay? Faith, hope, and love. We're going to look at this. Faith, let's break this down. We're going to look at faith first. Faith is, uh, the biblical vision of faith is simply to trust. To trust. And the question that we must ask ourselves when we're in times of in-between, what, what do we do when we don't know what to do? The challenge for us is that are we going to trust? Whose story are you going to trust? Whose story are you going to trust? When I was 15 years old uh, at a camp I attended, um, uh, well, I was 16. I became a Christian when I was 15. I didn't grow up a Christian. I uh, became a Christian when I was uh, 15. When I was 16, I felt the very real call that God had placed on my life to, to go into full-time ministry, to, to, to be a pastor. And, um, and I took that call very seriously. In fact, I spent the rest of my high school years learning how to do certain things that I, that I knew that pastors did. I, I used to be a pretty shy individual. Um, and, um, but I knew, gosh, if I'm going to be a pastor one day, i got to be a little bit more outgoing. Um, I didn't know, I'd never spoken in front of a crowd ever in my life. Uh, but okay, I, I, if I'm going to be a pastor, I've got to learn how to communicate. So I started taking debate classes and, and learning how to, to, you know, get the confidence to get in front of a crowd and, and share um, what God's doing. And so um, I went on this journey. And like I said, in the year 2000, um, I was invited to come to be a youth pastor here in Boise. Uh, and, uh, and I did that for seven years. And it was amazing. And then, again, I was trusting God with, with the story that he had. And God began to say, speak to my wife and I and, and saying, hey, um, uh, it's time that you guys go out and you start a church. And it's going to be a different kind of church, not, not a normal looking church. It's going to be different. And so we started um, a church called The Gathering. And that we met um, uh, originally at a school. Uh, then we left the school and we started meeting back at our, my house. And then we grew out of my house and we uh, rented a building in Meridian, uh, grew out of that. And then we rented a, a, a building in, um, off of Cole and Franklin. And we were there for a number of years. Um, and um, this church was, was everything for my wife and I. Um, we, we had the motto, Thinking Faith authentic community. And this is what drove us, is that uh, we wanted to be the kind of church that you don't turn off your brains when you come to church. Uh, you, you don't, you know, you engage with your mind. And so we, 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 um, we, we did a lot of that. We had an amazing community, a beautiful community. The Patties were a part of that community. And, and it was just this beautiful thing. Well, over time, um, uh, I had to go bivocational, which means um, our church wasn't big enough to support 
me as a full-time staff member. So I had a job. I had to go out and get a job. And, um, and so um, I went out and got a job. And one of those jobs was that um, uh, I helped start an internet marketing company called uh, Page One Power. And I was really good at that job. I was really good at that job. So good that um, I started to scale financially. You know, I mean, I'm like, I'm getting raises, I'm getting promotions, I'm traveling the country, um, uh, uh, going to different, you know, New York and Chicago, doing all these things, and I got really good. And what happened was, the enemy got a hold of my heart, because I began to trust my own story, and I began to let go trusting of God's story. Because God never let go of me and that calling to be a pastor, but I started getting into a place where we, you know... I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but for us, we had never had a lot of money. We were super poor, uh, and then when I started getting, like, six figures, I wasn't equipped on how to handle that, and we got really in debt, which is crazy to think when you're making a lot of money how quickly you can still get in debt. And we were not in a healthy place financially at all. And what happened is that I got um, uh, pigeonholed in this job where I couldn't leave. I wanted to leave. I wanted to be a full-time pastor. In fact, there were people in our church community that wanted us to do that. But But I was afraid to let go of that because of all the debt and all the things that I couldn't afford, you know, and I was making all this money and and to walk away from that. I, I began to stop trusting the story God had told me, and I was trusting in my own story. Well, it got to a point where in our lives that, and there's, you know, a lot to this, but, um, I had to step down from the church that we had started. Um, It was time to move on. I was bivocationally working a full-time job that was super demanding and leading a church full-time. It it was crushing me inside. I, I I couldn't function. I wasn't sleeping. I was in a really bad physical space, um, emotionally, mentally. Um, and I got to a point where I knew that if I didn't step down, I was going to start resenting my job as a pastor. And so I made the decision. My wife and I, we prayed, this, and we made the decision, we're going to step down. And so we did in 2017, 10 years of leading this church. And it was one of the hardest decisions I ever made, but here's the thing. It was, it was super hard, and it was a, it was a big struggle to, to get through that. But in the back of my mind, I kind of went, but I've got a really good job. I'm really good at it. It pays me really well. So I'll, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. So I left. I left the church. I stepped away from the thing that God asked me to do, thinking I can take care of myself. Well, not too long after that, God has a funny way of working I actually got laid off from the job that was paying me really well, and I had a ton of success, and I helped start. I got laid off. So in a matter of time, I had let go of the calling that God had placed in my life, and now I don't even have a job. And you want to talk about identity. I went through a year-long bout of deep, serious depression, asking the question, now who am I? Now who am I? I don't have a calling. That's gone. I don't don't even have a job. That's gone. Oh, and now we get to file for bankruptcy. Yeah. Because we're so in over our head. The amount of depression, shame, and guilt that I carried with me was debilitating. Stopped going to church for a year. I didn't even want to step inside of a church. It was debilitating. I had forgotten to trust the story. Then there's hope. What is hope? If faith is trusting the story, then hope is remembering the story. Hope is this thing where we remember, we reflect. Hope is about the future, the thing that we know is coming but is not yet here. Hope is about remembering the story. 
You see, when I was in this place of depression, it was a year we got, we weren't going to church, we weren't doing, any, doing anything. I had forgotten the story. And I needed to be reminded. And you see, when we're in places like this, like God is faithful to us in that he puts people around us to help us remember. I remember so clearly the Sunday that we were sitting at home. I was probably watching football. And look, I'll be honest, like when you stop going to church for a little while, it's so easy to not go to church again. It really is. That habit of just like, well, this is nice. I get to, you know, wake up and 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 just kind of do my own thing and 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 have an extra cup of, you know, and and not get dreaded and be in my PJs until you know noon or whatever. I don't do that. You guys don't do that either. But um, I got in this habit of just of just sitting and and it was like this like this kind of pity party for me. And I remember this Sunday specifically when my wife came in. And I was sitting in front of the TV. My wife came in. And, and maybe she didn't say it just like this. this is, but this is how I heard it is how I remember it. Um, um, but I remember her coming in and she says, okay, it's been a year. We are not not going to church people. Let's go find a church. And it was that moment that sparked something in me that was like, yeah, you're right. You're right. Just because this is my life and and I've lost so much doesn't mean that there's not a chapter yet to be written. And so we started looking for a church. Hope is about remembering. I remember people in my life that would call me. I remember the Pattees. I remember specifically Cecilia telling me, Joe, no, God's not done with you. No, I'm, I'm not going to be in ministry. I'm, I'm good. I, I'm, you know, I'm just going to not do that ever again. It's like, no, no, Joe, that's not your story. I remember people in my life, like some good friends of ours, the McFates, doing the same thing. I would talk them on the phone. They say, no, Joe, there's something there. No, I'm done. I'm done. New chapter. I'm going to do, no. They helped me remember, remember what? Remember to trust that, wait a minute, God called me to do this. And I needed to remember to trust that story. That's what hope is. Hope is remembering the story. And in times in your life when you are at a place of of low and defeat and struggle, Because here's the thing, the reality of being a Jesus follower doesn't mean that all of a sudden everything's perfect. In fact, you just get to live life like everyone else except for the reality that you are not alone through it. The goal in life is not to, you know, not have conflict in life. The goal in life is to get through conflict in a healthy way. Because we are all going to experience conflict, pain, hurt, Suffering. The reality is, for Jesus followers, is that you're not alone. You have one that walks with you through it. In the midst of the storm, there is one standing with you. Hope is remembering that. And some of you need to be reminded of that this morning because you've lost hope. You've lost hope. And I want to encourage you to remember, trust the story of what, who Jesus is, and what he's done for you. Remember that there is a, a, a hope, a future for you that God has. And don't give up on that. And then lastly, love. Love is living the story. Right? I trust the story. Okay, God, I'm going to trust what you say. I'm going to, I'm going to remember the future, the, the not yet that's there, I'm going to remember the story, but now I've got to live the story. There was a season of us going to church where we, um, we just participated. And listen, after being in ministry for over 20 years and going back to church as a, just a, a participant, it's weird. 
It's weird because you know all the, the back end stuff that goes on. You know, you know, when the worship team and, and you see and, and, and listening to other pastors when you've been the primary teacher for, for over 20 years of your life and now you're sitting and listening and receiving. And, and all we did when we started going back to church was just loving faithfully. Serving by by doing commu- helping doing communion or uh, being a greeter at the door or whatever it meant to just be a part of the community with no expectation except to simply love. Our only aim was to sit and love, live the story. Love is that action of what Jesus people do. And here's the thing: Why would Paul say? Let love rule, or, or the greatest of these is love. Because here's the thing. There are times when you trusting the story is a little iffy, right? You're just like, mm, did Jesus, oh, do I believe that? And, and you struggle to trust the story. There are times that you lose hope. And in the midst of these things, why, does lo- why is love the greatest? Because love isn't predicated on what you trust and what you know. Love is an action that you do in spite of what you think and do. There are many times we come to church and we serve and we give of our talents and we're not in the greatest space. Let's be honest, right? We put the show, we put the mask on when we walk in because we don't want anybody to see that we had a bad day or, or we're fighting with our spouse or I just got done yelling at the kids or whatever or I'm, I'm about to lose a job and, and financially we're not healthy and it's, a, it's pressure and it's stress. We don't like the reality of being in an authentic community like this is that you don't have to pretend here. You don't have to pretend. And sometimes when we come, we don't feel it. And that's why love is the greatest, because it's the ethic that keeps going in spite of what we experience or believe. We choose to love. And you must choose to love, because it ain't easy to love. It ain't easy to be patient and kind and long-suffering. It's not. You choose to do it. You act out in love towards each other. You see, and this is so important for Paul because he's like, look, y'all are coming together. You're Greek and Roman and Jew, and you are, um, you know, uh, rich and you're poor, and some of you are still slaves, and some of you are free, and now, you know, there's male and female, and all these people group are coming together. And the only way this great experiment is going to work is if you act in love. You must act in love. And so, Jane and I, we just lived in love and serving and giving what we could. And here's the beautiful thing. Not too long, we have been going to the church for maybe a couple years, and, uh, um, and the pastor there um, took me to lunch and said, Joe, I'd like you to come on staff. And you know, I didn't want to do it. I was afraid to do it. And if it weren't for my wife, I wouldn't have done it. But thank God she married me because I'd be a mess without her. She said, Joe, are you crazy? We went through this season where we lost our church, right? We, were at the point, we lost our church, lost my job, went through bankruptcy, went through depression, started finding some healing in a church. And the beautiful thing about God is that God was never done with me. God had never given up on me. The truth is God had to get me back to a place where I was usable. He had to, so it was like this, this season of downward spiral, and God, I could just imagine God going, hang, hang on, Joe, hang on, Joe, hang on, Joe. I just got to get you back to where I can use you because you stopped trusting me. So in losing what I felt like was everything was God's way of giving me everything and restoring me back to where he wanted me. Faith, hope, love. It's about 
trusting the story. It's about remembering the story. It's about living the story. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You trust the story. You remember the story. You live the story. You keep doing that. Let God do the rest. This is my take home for you as we wrap up. When we don't know what to do, keep doing these three things. When we don't know what to do, keep doing these three things. Church, you're in a transition. Yep, it happens. But luckily, churches aren't about a person. Well, the person, but not a human. Right? It's about this. It's about this. This this is the church. And there are all different parts that got to be played. Paul talked about it. You want to go back and read it, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There are lots of different parts to be played. But that's the beauty of the church. And so what do we do when we're not sure what to do when we're taking next steps? Just keep doing these three things. Keep trusting the story that God has for this, this beautiful church. Remember God's faithfulness, times past and times future of what he has for you. And keep acting in love towards each other. Keep acting in love towards each other because the enemy wants to get at work. And the only thing that's going to stop that work is your love for each other. Faith, hope, love. Continue to trust in Jesus. Remember God's faithfulness in times past and fix your eyes on the promise that he offers in the future and decide to continue acting in love toward each other today. This is my challenge for you. As you walk out of this place, what are the ways that I'm going to act in love in this, this community of Jesus people? Trying our best to live our lives after the one that, that we model it after. How do we act out in love towards each other? Serve and give, trusting, hoping, loving. Let me pray with you as we close. Father, you are good. You are kind. You are faithful to us. Sometimes, God, it's it's hard to remember that. Especially when when I'm in the midst of it, God, it's hard to remember that. that You are good, you are kind, and you are faithful. God, when things aren't working out the way that we think, it's hard to trust. When we're running comparisons in our brain about, well, I have this over here and I have that, God, it's hard to just trust you. hard to act out in love, God, when when things are messy. I thank you that you can inspire a guy some 2,000 years ago to write such powerful words to this small community in Corinth but had lasting impact on us today. And so, God, as we move from this place, Help us have faith, hope, love. And when all else fails, God, that we cling to love. I pray, God, that your spirit would move over this church, this community of Jesus' people. Lead, love well. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this message and would like to learn more, you can join us in person or online for services at 10 a.m. on Sundays. We would also love to connect with you. You can fill out a connect card on our website at collectivechurch.org and also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube.